this week. I think more countries are becoming aware they've got to step up their game before we go to Glasgow for the Conference of the Parties meeting. Countdown to COP. A month out from Glasgow, world leaders set the stage at the UN General Assembly ahead of the crucial climate summit. We'll do everything in our power to help people in the short term, but what we will also do is uh, make sure that we allow the, the market to work so the supplies get to the places that they, they need to. One of the hot topics of conversation at the meeting, Europe's energy crisis. We break down what's causing it and how bad it's likely to get. We're going to make it affordable for all companies and all countries to take the green approach. Plus, it isn't just policymakers pledging climate action. Billionaire Bill Gates is joining forces with business heavyweights to rally support for some of the world's most demanding clean energy projects. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green. It's now just over one month until the UN Climate Change Conference, also called COP26, in Glasgow. The criticality of the next decade will be at the top of the agenda, as the IPCC says we need massive investment in green technologies to avoid disaster. One person attempting to meet that challenge is Bill Gates, who started his $1 billion catalyst fund to kickstart climate solutions. The model here is what happened with wind and solar and lithium ion. Those products had very high prices compared to conventional techniques. And fortunately, uh, Germany, Japan, other buyers uh, funded the scale up. And now those products fit the normal sort of client investing metrics. You know, those are mature and they're in this big scale up phase. The four areas we picked here, green hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuel, storage and direct air capture are at a much earlier stage where they have a very high green premium, but by designing scale-up projects with catalyst capital uh, and government uh, capital, we will learn, uh, you know, deploy these innovations, pick the right approach, and get that premium down uh, in the same way happening in those other areas. So over this ne next decade, we need all the green technologies uh, that you know, can reduce in every type of emission uh, to get to where solar and wind are. Uh, and so we get for the, the 20 years after that uh, the, into this high speed scale up and we're tapping into literally, you know, hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. But this upfront design of the projects uh, to pick the right partners, places and bring those, those costs down uh, these are four technologies that are ready for that. In fact, we just put out uh, a solicitation for people to say which projects would they like us uh, to partner uh, now that we have over a, a billion dollars in capital. So I would just add one thing, Eric. Sure, please. You know, unlike when, when Bill talked about uh, the, the pathway for solar and wind, that was a 30 year pathway to bring it competitive to hydrocarbon. We don't have 30 years. We don't have 10 years. Uh, and, and so to me, this is about the acceleration of the science and technology. This is about really emphasizing these, these areas where we have to focus if we're going to get to a net zero world. Many economies are already benefiting from advancements in green technology as wind and solar replace conventional fossil fuels. But these advances aren't equally shared and an uneven green revolution won't solve global emissions. Gates has a plan to tackle inequality by driving down the cost of climate solutions. Today, many areas of emissions like making steel and cement uh, or aviation fuel, the green premium is very high. Uh, in many cases, almost double the price. And so if we try and do this brute force, only the richest countries or companies will be able to offset their emissions. Now, it's great that they're willing to do that, but we call it catalyst because by taking the resources and funding these projects, 
We're going to make it affordable for all companies and all countries mm -hmm. to take the green approach <clears throat> because we'll either get the green premium down to zero, which as you say, for solar and wind, that's where we are. And so now it's just accelerating the, the scale up deployment uh, of that gigantic electricity grid. But a lot of people aren't aware that you know, passenger cars with the lithium ion batteries and electric generation, that's where we've made the most project progress, but that's only a third of the emissions. And so that's why getting these other areas of emissions uh, to be priced either close to competitive or uh, actually completely competitive, that is the highest priority. Uh, and so going into Glasgow, you know, having this partnership including with the governments as well, uh, making this concrete, I think, you know, shows the momentum that climate's gaining and it, you know, shows that we really aren't ignoring the fact that India and other middle-income countries uh, at today's state of the art, they won't uh, deny the, the electricity and the shelter to their citizens uh, that uh, going for uh, today's green pre premium would imply. So I, I view this as a critical next step. As one of Catalyst's founding partners, BlackRock's Larry Fink sees climate change as a risk to the entire global financial system. But he says investing with Catalyst isn't just about mitigating risk, it's also about creating a better world. Already we're seeing an impact in society right now from climate risk and climate change. We are seeing insurance premiums uh, going up 18% a year right now. So we're seeing a real impact from what climate risk is doing, from, from, from flooding, from fires. So we're seeing a big impact. And so the faster that we could find ways to mitigating the rising temperatures, I would say the more just society could be. And so to me, it's, 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 we don't have much time. And this is why uh, when I learned about Catalyst and I learned about what Bill was doing, it was very clear to me why we needed to be a part of this, why we needed to, to invest the time and the money. And the, the key is also the time because we need to be learning about these new, uh, the new technologies and how to move forward. And we need to then inform our investors ultimately where we think uh, the next opportunities are gonna be too. And uh, as, as Bill, Bill in his book wrote about, we, we need to employ $50 trillion to get to a, uh, to a green world. Uh, that, with the rising deficits that we see in governments, from our perspective, the 50 trillion is mostly gonna to have to come from the private sector. And I do believe that money will be well spent, well spent for returns. It will transform our economies. Uh, it will build new jobs. It will build, build new uh, cities and new, opp new opportunities. So I look at this as an optimist. I don't look at this as a pessimist, but, but the key is to be that optimist. We have to jump on it now. We have to be investing today. We need to talk about it today, although a lot, much of the problem is in the future. But we're seeing more and more evidence of the problem today. Coming up, surging energy prices in Europe are causing chaos, turning attention to the role of renewables. We'll discuss that and how big a part it'll play at COP in a few weeks' time. This is Bloomberg Green. Jennifer Zabasadja, and here's everything you need to know in green this week. The European Central Bank is warning a failure to mitigate climate change could significantly lower Europe's economic output by the end of the century. If natural disasters become more severe as a result of climate change, the region's GDP could drop by 10 percent by the year 2100 compared to a scenario where governments act. Also, oil and gas companies have been bankrolled by some of the biggest names in finance to tap the art vast natural wealth. According to a report by Reclaim Finance, Gazprom, ConocoPhillips, and Total Energies, they're among a number of firms expanding their fossil fuel operations in the region. The research says Arctic oil and gas output is set to climb 20% over the next five years. And finally, a group of nonprofits is urging the European Union not to cave into pressure to put new gas-fired power stations in its green rule book. The letter sent to the bloc's leaders by 
over 150 campaign groups, says to do so would undermine the European Green Deal. Some member states want the option to fall back on gas as they transition away from coal. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja, and that's your Green Brief. Thanks, Jen. Long one of Europe's worst performing countries when it comes to tackling climate change, Ireland's prime minister insists green issues are now firmly central to government policy. Micheál Martin spoke exclusively to Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde about his plans on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly right here in New York. I think the key agenda item for Ireland uh, on the energy front is wind, uh, mm. and we've been great developers of onshore wind. The next decade in Ireland will be offshore wind, uh, and we have streamlined our planning applic application framework for investors so they have certainty in terms of uh, applying to invest in terms of offshore wind infrastructure in Ireland. So that will be a key agenda item of ours uh, and renewables. We have a very strong climate component in our government and in our government programme, uh, and that, of course, is not disconnected from the energy um, uh, agenda. And there will be challenges of that, there is no doubt, but we, we are making considerable progress. Are you worried about the here and now? Are you worried about blackout risks? Are you worried about the amount of consumption data is taking up in Ireland? Data is taking up a considerable uh, uh, demand in, 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 in energy terms. Uh, but we have been robust um, in, in terms of meeting that to date. And I'm confident that we have the right mix uh, to, main, uh, to maintain that sort of robust response. I mean, for us, the, the two key pillars of the next stage of economic growth is digitalization and climate in the green economy. So mm -hmm. our investments are targeted as we emerge from COVID towards the green economy um, and towards digitalization. Um, and we've got to try and marry the two in respect of the various challenges that will arise um, from them. And COVID has taught us many lessons and has accelerated some of the push on the technology front, particularly in terms of the delivery of health services. And also, we think, has given people a closer connection with nature uh, and an appreciation of existential threats. Um, that you know, COVID has created that in terms of a pandemic and a virus. People now have a greater, I think, understanding of how near now that existential threat climate change represents mm. than perhaps they may have had prior to COVID. So talk to us about net zero by 2050. Will Ireland achieve it? Yes, and uh, we've, put in, we've passed a climate law uh, in Ireland which sets very ambitious targets of reducing emissions by about 51% by 2030 and net zero by uh, 2050. Uh, and that is a very strong commitment of ours across every sector. And by the end of the year, we will be publishing carbon budgets for each individual sector, um, from transport uh, to agriculture uh, and to industry. Mm. Um, and we, we have to move fast as a country. And we have, to set, we have set very challenging targets, but we are absolutely determined with our European Union colleagues to achieve them. Irish Prime Minister Micheál Martin speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde on Ireland's climate goals and Europe's energy supply problems. And policymakers all across the continent are attempting to ease pressures on gas prices that hit record highs last week. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison. So, Rachel, to what degree are we going to just have to get used to higher energy prices in electricity and gas? It certainly looks like the high prices that we're seeing at the moment aren't going anywhere soon. Obviously, we have this supply crunch and winter hasn't even started. Winter is the time when we use more energy and prices generally are higher. So at least for this winter, we're going to see higher prices. And generally, I think most people agree that energy prices are going to go up. Let's talk about the kind of energy we're using, because obviously there's a pivot toward green. This energy transition is underway. And are renewables going to be a problem going forward? It's interesting. That's something that policymakers have pointed to this gas crisis as highlighting the need for more renewables. And therefore, we would get ourselves off the influence of the high priced gas. But with that comes the intermittency problem, which no one seems to have solved yet. It's been a problem in the UK across Europe where a period of unusually low wind has coincided with these high gas prices and has caused chaos. And so it's coming up with solutions to that. How do we back up the intermittent renewable generation with something that's also clean? So Rachel, let's look forward to COP26. It's just about a month away. How big of a deal is this energy crisis going to be for those attending? 
it's going to overshadow things if we don't find any kind of solution before then. We have uh, the topic coming up with European leaders. Now ministers are talking about it. It's becoming widespread. And as those costs get passed on to consumers, we're going to see politicians talking about it more. It's going to be weighing on them as the costs go through into bills. And so I think it could be quite a big part of what one of the concerns going into COP and, and people are worried that it's going to slow down progress towards net zero mm. if high costs come along with that net zero um, trajectory. A lot's on the agenda. Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison, thank you so much for joining us. Coming up, as we count down to COP, the leaders of the world's two largest economies and emitters promise to boost their efforts to fight climate change. We hear from U.S. climate envoy John Kerry next. This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Well, President Biden has pledged to double the money the U.S. will spend helping poorer nations fight climate change. It has drawn a mixed response from environmentalists ahead of COP26 in November, which many believe is the last real chance to clinch an effective deal. U.S. climate envoy John Kerry has been pressing the case globally. He spoke with Bloomberg this week. I think more countries are becoming aware they've got to step up their game before we go to Glasgow for the conference of the parties meeting. Uh, we also have had uh, the United States, President Biden, put on the table a doubling of the amount of money that the United States will do in terms of the 100 billion total that has to be put together. China announced yesterday they will no longer fund coal externally in other countries. So um, people are taking steps. People are beginning to build some momentum, I think. The question is, will it be enough? So, as you say, President Biden uh, up to, uh, doubled the commitment from the United States toward the $100 billion. Is that enough? Because I've seen some estimates that say that actually it should be more like $40 billion should be the U.S. share toward well, that $100 billion. Well, they doubled the doubling. Uh, and I, I think uh, everybody understands that we uh, have a complicated Congress right now. I think it's what the market will bear. But it's also uh, a significant increase of the United States effort. I mean, President Biden is putting more, you know, about 11 billion plus on the table. Uh, and that's an important contribution. Other countries need to also do their part. You said what the market will bear, maybe what Congress will bear. Is it your best estimate, having served there for so long, mm -hmm. that actually you can get the 11.4 billion through yeah, this Congress? Yeah, for sure. I, I really believe that. I think that there's a majority in Congress now that understands after this summer, Mother Nature's messages to the United States and the world have been pretty clear, and that is that the climate crisis is growing. It already costs us hundreds of billions of dollars. That's what we spend for the intensity of the storms we're witnessing, the flooding, uh, the amount of uh, fire loss, damages, the warming of the ocean. These things are all growing in uh, their ability to be able to disrupt the marketplace. And if you want to look at real cost, that disruption is hundreds of times beyond the amount that's being asked to help solve the problem. President Biden clearly has made climate a priority, including making you his special envoy on climate questions. We have the budget proposal kicking around the Congress right now, up to $3.5 trillion. A significant portion of that is devoted to climate. Uh, can that get through, through reconciliation? Well, I hope it can. I mean, that's beyond my pay grade right now. I'm the climate guy, not the budget guy or the, you know, uh, I know that the White House is working hard, the President's working hard on that, and I hope it will happen because it's actually not an expenditure. It's an investment that will repay itself many times over in the United States. Many countries are now chasing new technologies. We need to be doing that. We need to be the, you know, the country that we've traditionally been, where we're the we're the people who go to the moon, invent the internet, can drive a rover around Mars. I mean, we do amazing things when we put ourselves to the task. We need to do that now so that we're helping to invent, if not inventing ourselves, the new fuels, the new storage capacity, the battery storage, the green hydrogen, the direct air carbon capture, the carbon capture utilization and storage techniques. There are so many things that need to be done in this, David, that we've got to 
we've got to you know unleash this incredible entrepreneurial innovative skill we have in America and uh, I think uh, there are a majority of people in the United States Congress who can see the benefit of doing so that was US special presidential envoy for climate John Kerry Meanwhile, COP26 President Alok Sharma told Bloomberg that he welcomed the pledge, but developed nations need to do more. Collectively, uh, donor nations, developed nations have to deliver on this $100 billion a year figure, which uh, was promised uh, back in 2009. And, and the, the developed country said that uh, from 2020 onwards up to 2025, every year, a hundred billion dollars would be uh, mobilized. Um, so I think this does provide a boost, and I think it will act as an unblocker in some of the discussions that are ongoing on. And I hope what it will also uh, ensure is that it provides a spur for other donors uh, to come forward as well with uh, additional commitments. Uh, in addition to that, um, just referencing President Biden's speech, um, he talked about the fact uh, that there can be intense disagreements among countries, but that in the end, we're all fighting together on certain things, climate being one of them, which brings me to China. Can Western countries and China work together on this in a real meaningful way when there are so many tensions, whether you're dealing with trade or human rights? I can tell you from all the conversations that I've heard, had is that countries around the world recognize that climate change is a great leveler. It does not recognize borders and they can see themselves what is happening in their own countries. This isn't just about something that's happening internationally. This is happening, uh, happening in, in uh, the nations around the world. So they see the reason why we need to work together on this. What we want to see are two things. One of the detailed policies that deliver on these commitments. And the second, and this is really important, are those commitments uh, in the near term, the 2030 emission reduction targets that every G20 nation, indeed every nation in the world, needs to come forward with. But I think particularly the biggest emitters need to set those out before COP26. And the difficulty is kind of what happens in the medium term. And this leads us to what we're seeing in Europe and the UK in terms of, you know, record high power prices and LNG prices. You're seeing high LNG prices over in Asia as well. That, that hurts. Um, how do we do this? How do we avoid those things? Don't we need it's things a, like coal and nuclear, the stuff we want to phase out? Don't we need that, though, in the medium term? Well, I think the first thing to, to this issue of, um, uh, of what's happening in terms of the gas markets, uh, you know, I, I, I can say with confidence that uh, consumers will not face sort of huge spikes. Uh, and of course, the other issue is uh, certainty of supply. And again, uh, I know there's been a lot of this in the media, but uh, uh, our uh, energy minister has been talking to the sector, and I think our view is very clearly that there are not going to be issues in terms of uh, uh, supplies this this winter. Um, but there is a wider point, of course, is that we need it, this just spurs on the need for us to do more in terms of renewables, uh, both in terms of uh, you know offshore wind, in terms of solar, but then also the base load as well uh, in, in you know building forward in in hydrogen, for instance, which I know is an area that lots of governments are currently focused on. And I can tell you from uh, the UK experience, uh, in less than ten years, we have gone from 40% of our electricity coming from coal to less than 2% now. And uh, by the end of 2024, we will have no more coal in our energy mix. And the reason that we've been able to do this is that we have built the biggest offshore wind sector in the world. And yep. we're going to quadruple that over the next 10 years. So, you know, we have demonstrated, other countries have demonstrated that actually the way forward is clean energy. And that's a transition that we want to see around the world. A lot to look out for as we enter the final stretch on the road to COP26. That's it for this week's edition, but you can keep the conversation going. Follow us on Twitter, at Climate. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green.